want you to hit me as hard as you can. Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. It's Who do you love? Ow, ow, no, no, sit, sit. Hello there, and welcome back to John Hughes Revisited. This week, we're firing up the old computer and strapping bras to our heads as we take a look back at Weird Science. Weird Science. Released in 1985, the same year as our Lord and Savior, Marty McFly, Weird Science is a genre-bending sci-fi teen comedy about two high school nerds who use a computer program to literally create their dream woman. Remember how I said Pretty in Pink was an outlier in Hughes' teen flick series? Well, Weird Science is a straight-up anomaly. It's the antithesis of the more grounded, emotionally raw teen movies he made. Written and directed by Hughes, naturally, it was the first time that the filmmaker really blends genres and goes for some major swings. The film is loosely based on the story, Made of the Future, by Al Feldstein, in which a man builds a wife from a kit he got on a trip to the year 2150. That story was printed in a 50s anthology comic book series called, you guessed it, Weird Science. Published by the company EC Comics, the same publisher as the more popular series Tales from the Crypt and Mad Magazine. The rights of the magazine were acquired by the film's producer, Joel Silver. According to Silver, Hughes was in his office one day when boxes of the comics were being delivered and unpacked. Upon seeing the title Weird Science and thinking of a beautiful woman he and Silver had seen earlier that day, Hughes wondered, what if two kids figured out a way to make that girl? And the rest is 80s history. As usual, Hughes quickly whipped up the script in only two days, the same amount of time it takes Amazon to ship out the Blu-ray for this film. Now, before we continue further, we'd like to thank you for watching John Hughes Revisited. If you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes live. Now back to the show. The film stars Hughes regular Anthony Michael Hall as awkward teen Gary Wallace. Hall had actually passed on National Lampoon's European vacation to be in this film, probably due to the fact that Hughes would actually be involved with this production. Elan Mitchell Smith co-stars as Wyatt Donnelly, Gary's nerdy best friend. Before Elan started acting, he attended a ballet school on scholarship. Today, he very seldom acts, only recently appearing in the Goldbergs' version of Weird Science as Mr. Connolly, and instead became a professor of medieval English literature at Cal State Long Beach. Once a nerd, always a nerd, I suppose. Nerd! Kelly LeBrock plays Lisa, the perfect dream woman who was created from Wyatt's computer. Demi Moore and Robin Wright also auditioned for the part, and another Kelly was originally cast as Lisa, Kelly Emberg, but she was replaced shortly after filming commenced. LeBrock initially turned down the role as she was enjoying her own European vacation in France at the time and was having too much fun riding horses on the beach. Her character's name was inspired by Apple's first GUI computer, the Apple Lisa. It was the first personal computer to have a graphical user interface. Basically, you can play and click on icons instead of typing line commands. Released in 1983, it sold very poorly due to its massive cost of about $10,000, not adjusted for inflation, but it had a lasting influence on computers and on John Hughes' imagination. Credit where credit's due, LeBrock really holds her own opposite these two hormone-crazed teenagers. We also have the late and great Bill Paxton playing Wyatt's older brother Chet, who loves to torture the little guy until LeBrock's Lisa turns him into the turd monster. Hi, dudes! Paxton got his character's distinctive military-style haircut without Hughes' permission. On Paxton's very first day on set, he told the makeup artist that he wanted a haircut that was really intense. Fortunately, Hughes loved it, along with everything else the actor brought to the character. You stood, buttwad! Megastar Robert Downey Jr. plays Ian, one of the bullies. Hughes had almost worked with Downey before on Pretty in Pink, when Ringwald lobbied for him to get the part of Ducky, but the filmmakers went with John Cryer instead. 
RDJ and AMH would later work together on the 1985 to 86 season of Saturday Night Live, also known as one of SNL's worst seasons ever. Yeah, yeah and I, I think we proved our point, Mr. Political Analyst. They've remained good friends as Hall is the godfather of RDJ's son. Robert Russler plays Max, the other bully, in his film debut. Suzanne Snyder and Judy Aronson play Deb and Hilly respectively, the love interests for the bullies as well as the leading nerds. Vernon Wells has a part in the third act as Lord General, the leader of the mutant biker gang, essentially reprising his role for Mad Max, the road warrior. I guess Joel Silver must have liked working with Wells and Paxton, as they would both go on to star in Commando, another film he produced that released later that same year. John Capellos was also another character actor that Hughes loved collaborating with. He plays the candy bar club owner, Dino. The cuss word, Malaka, that Capellos used was actually a Greek swear, and it angered his mother when she saw the film. Also, something to note, other than Anthony Michael Hall, John Capellos was the only actor to appear in all three of John Hughes' teen films made under contract with Universal. How about a nice, greasy pork sandwich served in a dirty ashtray? Robert Russler, who plays Max the Bully, said the first scene he ever filmed as a professional actor was when his character dumps the slushie on Garrett and Wyatt at the mall. The celebratory handshake that he does with Robert Downey Jr. right before pouring it on them was improvised. There's also a very odd story involving RDJ clearing up the rumor that he, uh, defecated in Kelly LeBrock's trailer. I'm in my he stated that he and his co-star Robert Russler joked about defecating in people's trailers throughout the shoot. Do you think he'll embarrass us tonight? Eventually, he did the dirty deed in one female cast member's trailer, right on her chair. But it was not LeBrock's. The stunt almost got him fired, as Joel Silver questioned everyone in the cast as to who did it. And when he asked Downey, his response was, no, but I sure wish it was me who did it. Cool. Downey went on to state that there was never any tension between him and Hughes, and he highly respected their friendship. Rustler also noted that the scene when the rocket comes up through the floor was a complicated shot to execute. Right before cameras rolled, Hall farted loudly, breaking the cast member's concentration and ruining the take. Rustler estimated that the scene cost $100,000 to shoot. Since the take was blown, it had to be filmed in reverse, with additional tweaks in post-production. Of course, not everything made it into the final cut of the film. Some material left on the cutting room floor was a scene of Gary and Wyatt cooking in the kitchen at the very beginning, and a bunch of weenies wearing Devo helmets trying to get into Gary and Wyatt's party. Another sequence showed Max and Ian, after they fled the party once the bikers invade, being engulfed in multicolored clouds before transforming into a pig and donkey. They then bend over to see the reflections and hubcaps of a car, and tails rip through the seats of their pants. Producer Joel Silver insisted on cutting the scene, rationalizing that it detracted from a later transformation in the film. Obviously, he's referring to the large Chet monster puppet, which was designed to be solely operated by Paxton himself, but he became too claustrophobic in the suit to perform. So two little people were crammed inside and operated the creature in unison. Hey, Chet happens. During the house party sequence, even though Chet is away, Bill Paxton showed up in disguise to get in on the fun feeling of chaos on set while the party scenes were shot. I looked over the shots and couldn't find him. So if you spot him, please share with the rest of the class. The piano player, Kim Malin, who was also a Playboy model, performed her own stunts during the party scenes. This includes having her clothes ripped off like she was sitting behind a jet turbine, and a crane when thrust into the air before landing in the swimming pool half naked. And the final goodbye scene between Anthony Michael Hall, Elon Mitchell Smith, and Kelly LeBrock moved John Hughes to tears. Well, what about your girl in, um, Canada? She was in Canada. This girl's no morals. You know, I don't, I don't like that on a girl. I, it's rough having those kind of relationships, you'll see. <clears throat> anyway, get to work. The film was released in the U.S. on August 2nd, 1985, and placed number four at the box office in its opening weekend, behind Back to the Future, National Lampoon's European Vacation, the sequel to the original written by Hughes, and Fright Night. By the end of its theatrical run, the movie grossed just shy of $39 million worldwide against a budget of $7.5 million. The title song was written and performed by American new wave band Oingo Boingo, 
whose frontman was none other than Danny Elfman. According to Elfman, the song was written spontaneously while he was in the car driving home to LA after a phone call from director John Hughes asking him to write the song for his latest movie. Elfman claimed to have heard the whole thing in his head by the time he made it home to his studio to record the demo. The song itself reached number 45 on the US Billboard Hot 100 and had its own music video featuring the band performing in an abstract laboratory. Later, Elfman expressed embarrassment at the video, stating that he was horrified by the outcome and that it was the only Oingo Boingo music video in which he had not been involved with production. But we'll have to save that story for Danny Elfman Revisited. Now, because this film is so bizarre, I'd like to take a moment to show how it was marketed for international audiences. In Japan, the film was called Electric Venus, which a reporter once misheard as Electric Penis during an interview with star Elon Mitchell Smith. Eh, close enough. Other foreign titles include Dream Woman for Finland and Sweden, Oh This Science for Russia, and Touch Me I'm Yours for Denmark. In his review, Roger Ebert noted LeBrock as wonderful in her role and thought the film was funnier and a little deeper than the predictable story it might have been. His counterpart, Gene Siskel, wasn't as kind to the film, giving it one and a half stars out of four and referred to it as a disappointment. Ebert slammed Siskel for being too uptight and said to him, They sounded like the parents committee. No, I'm not like the yes, parents committee. In the time since its release, the film has become a cult classic. However, while the film was a hit when it came out, most critics seem to agree with Siskel, and it is now thought as one of John Hughes' lesser movies, not rising to the level of other classics like Sixteen Candles and The Breakfast Club. I mean, the next thing you know, you'll be wearing a bra on your head. Well, the old man's gonna have a stroke on this one for sure. Similar to Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the film received its own television spin-off, in 1994, a year before the film's 10th anniversary, it was made into a television series which also used the film's theme song as its own. It received not one, not two, five seasons consisting of 88 episodes running from 1994 to 98 on the USA Network. The series starred Vanessa Angel as Lisa, Michael Manasseri as Wyatt, John Mallory Asher as Gary, and Lee Turgeson as Chet. Here's where it gets really weird though, as instead of following the same basic plot of creating this woman in a computer, the series establishes that genies and other magical beings exist. In the show, Lisa is a genie master and implies that she's there to help the boys rather than having been created by them. I guess to be fair, the movie's version of Lisa acted more like a living god than a living doll. She can manipulate memories, molecules, and reality. She's like Scarlet Witch. I could only find a handful of episodes on YouTube, one of which has Bruce fucking Campbell guest starring as, what else, a magical genie. Fittingly, one of the series creators would go on to create the Evil Dead TV show, Ash vs. Evil Dead. Other guest stars on the show over the years were Denise Richards, Michael Clark Duncan, Larry Hankin of Breaking Bad fame, Adam West as himself, and Seth Green, who was actually one of the finalists for the part of Gary. Reportedly, John Hughes didn't even know that the TV series existed until he saw a commercial for it. Famously, Hughes refused to help on any television adaptation of his work, so the studio didn't even bother asking. Hughes told an interviewer that he was sitting at home watching TV, and this commercial comes on for this new show. He's watching it thinking, Jesus, they ripped me off. This looks just like weird science. Imagine his surprise. In 2013, news broke that Universal was planning a Weird Science remake with original producer Joel Silver returning and screenwriter Michael Bacall, who wrote Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and the 21 Jump Street movies, penning the script to involve a 3D printer this time around. The film was set to distinguish itself from the original by being an edgier comedy, more in line with 21 Jump Street and The Hangover. In 2017, Elon Mitchell Smith talked about a sequel to the original starring Channing Tatum. However, as of 2022, nothing more of the remake had materialized. Honestly though, this is truly a movie that could have only been made in the 80s. Could you even imagine this film getting a reboot with Channing Tatum today? Two nerdy 15 year old teenage girls creating a hunky guy in their bedroom and then having him take them around town telling people their relationship is purely sexual? Yikes. Like Molly Ringwald in Pretty in Pink, this would be Anthony Michael Hall's final collaboration with John Hughes. People always say Ringwald was John Hughes' muse, but I think they overlook Hall. 
He starred in three films directed by Hughes himself, as opposed to Ringwald's two. And Hughes had also worked with him earlier for National Lampoon's Vacation when he gave the young actor's big break as Rusty Griswold. In the time since splitting with Hughes, Hall had a similar career trajectory to Ringwald, starring in some lesser known films and venturing more into TV, landing the lead role in The Dead Zone. He's popped up over the years with a cameo in The Dark Knight and even a substantial role as Tommy Doyle in Halloween Kills, which, in my opinion, I thought he crushed that part. As far as weird science goes, this is definitely John Hughes' most out there and dated teen angst film. Scenes such as the computer sequence, which after watching this in Pretty in Pink back to back, I'm not sure John Hughes knew how computers worked, but I guess in the 80s, computers were basically magic to everyone. Also, the scene with Hall talking jive at the bar hasn't aged well. Hall said he and Hughes were inspired by Richard Pryor movies that they watched on the weekend, so I guess it was a product of its time. Even so, there's no denying that it's also a relic of the 80s, a film set in a bygone era with a questionable nature that more than earns the weird part of its title. It's hardly as refined as Hugh's other efforts, even if it contains similar themes from his previous outings. The film operates as pure teenage boy wish fulfillment, as if someone plugged this movie directly into the brain of a horny teenage boy. Hughes was not so much concerned with digging deep into these characters' psyches as he was with just letting everyone and everything run wild. That being said, it still has enjoyable performances and that Hughes charm as it really gave him a chance to blow up some steam and go balls to the wall with the story. So for those reasons, I award Weird Science 2.5 out of 5 turd monsters. Also, can anyone tell me what happened to Wyatt's catatonic grandparents stuffed in the kitchen pantry? Are they still in there? Did they wake up and just leave the house? Were they magically transported out of the house? Were their memories wiped like Gary's parents? I don't know what the hell you're talking about, Lucy, and I want you to shut up. Someone needs to check on those old folks. <clears throat> Anyways, until next time, thanks for watching.